Um, hi everyone, I'm Jenny and um, Ali and I are from Humanly. Um, Humanly is an award-winning design studio specialising in designing products, services and systems for social impact. Um, and we mainly work on designing solutions um, such as products and services and helping organisations become more human-centred. We work with a lot of different organisations, from really small organisations like tech for good startups and social enterprises to national charities, central and local government, international NGOs and UN agencies. So it's like the full spectrum. Um, we're not specific to any particular sector and um, we just work with any organisation on any project that aims to achieve a positive social impact. Um, and a bit about ourselves. Um, I'm a designer by background. I founded Humanly a couple of years ago and um, bring human-centred design experience to the team. I'm Ali. Um, I've got a really varied background, but a lot of my background is in education and special educational needs. So I was a teacher in special schools for quite a long time, and then I worked. Um, I did a master's in special and inclusive education, um, and worked with adults with um, learning disabilities and autism, and was Asperger syndrome project officer at the University of Cambridge. So I came to human centred design um, from that background. So brought those. Sort of skills with me and then learnt human centred design. Uh, I've been working in that field since about 2015. And we work on a lot of different topics. So um, we've worked, we're working right, right now on cancer, we've worked on dementia, mental health, and um, lots of different issues. But tonight we're going to be talking about some work we've done with people with learning disabilities. And um, we've actually done about four projects working to um, design services for people with learning disabilities. But when I, tonight we're going to talk about one, which is Daybook. Um, and the whole starting point for the project was this idea that um, cons government consultations are not accessible for people with learning disabilities. And the charity Voiceability had the idea to build a, a digital consultation platform that would enable people with learning disabilities to take part in gov government consultations. Um, and what they did was they took that idea to the Department of Health and they managed to get innovation funding to do a two-year project and um, they brought in Humanly to lead on research and design. They brought in uh, Neon Tribe as the developer and public perspectives to do the impact and evaluation study. Um, and the first thing that we did was try to reframe the project because they already had a very clear solution in mind. Um, not the details, but they already knew you know, quite a lot of what they wanted to build. Um, so what we do in our process is we start, go right, we go right back to the problem. So we, we try to redefine what's, well, what's the problem we're trying to solve here and let's keep an open mind about what the solution will be. And then we went through our whole design process, which starts with um, ethnographic and creative research, which we're going to talk about quite a lot. Um, and coming up with lots of ideas, so not fixating on one solution, but multiple possible solutions, prototyping different ideas, and then refining that into um, a product that was then built and tested. So what we, what we discovered when we tried to really nail down on what the problem was is that there are some really specific problems with the current consultation model that actually make consultations problematic or at least unenjoyable for most people, um, but it makes it specifically extremely difficult for people with learning disabilities to take part. So you've got um, normally very focused, closed questions that are being asked um, and are really difficult for people with learning disabilities to respond to. And um, we know that asking direct questions can make people with learning disabilities feel like it's a test and there's a right or a wrong answer. So immediately you've got bias because sometimes people will just tell you what they think you want to hear. Then often they require a written or a ver verbal response. So typically it's you know, fill in this questionnaire or come to a meeting. Um, if you've got non-verbal communication and you can't read and write, then it's going to be impossible for you to express your views in that consultation. Um, third of all, those kind of face-to-face -face meetings are usually held during the day at the council's office. Um, so again, you're creating additional barriers for someone. You're not going to them, you're asking them to come to you. Um, and finally, we find out that the people with learning disabilities who do take part in consultations are usually the kind of usual suspects. So there's a small cohort of people who use verbal communication, who are always involved and kind of always consulted over and over again, regardless of the topic. So you're not really getting a representation of people's views more widely. 
Um, and what this results in is that in government consultations about issues that affect people with learning disabilities or even services that are only for people with learning disabilities and um, rely on the views of other people. So you've got the views of carers, you've got the views of service providers um, and most of the time if you actually look at who's responded it's a very small percentage of people who actually have a learning disability. Um, so this was one, one, one of many examples we found um, on a local authority consultation about respite services for adults with a learning disability and only 15% of people who were consulted were people with a learning disability, so the target audience of the service. Um, and we saw this time and time again. And we don't believe this would be acceptable for any other user group. Can you imagine delivering a service to any other group of people and accepting that kind of um, response rate from the target users? Um, so that's what we wanted to change. Um, and once we had clearly articulated the problem we we're trying to change, that enabled us to start you know, deeply exploring that problem from the perspective of people affected. So um, we did this by working um, uh, across a really wide geographic area. Um, we worked with three local authority areas, so uh, South Tyneside, Liverpool and Gloucestershire. Uh, and we also worked with a service in London. Um, and this was very deliberate in terms of we had obviously uh, like a city location. We had um, a really large rural um, county. Um, and South Tyneside, which is actually a really, really little sort of um, authority, um, but you know, really geographically spread um, to make sure we weren't just sort of representing one part of the country. And the way we did our research was to go and meet as many different people as we possibly could um, in those areas. Uh, we met with 17 groups of people with learning disabilities around the UK. And we went to people where they were. So we worked by going and, and meeting people in the locations that they were already accessing. So in some instances, that was in sort of more traditional um, formal services like um, local authority, like council run day services and respite services, in colleges. Um, we found private events companies, technology groups, arts groups, um, a drop-in centre, a disco and a pub. We've since uh, become quite connoisseurs of uh, night club nights for people with a learning disability. Um, in, across all of our projects, we always, the first question, or one of the first questions is, what's the local club night? Because it's a great place to meet people who have a learning disability, but might not be accessing formal services um, or more traditional services. So always go to the nightclub uh, and advocacy groups as well. So we really tried to reach as many different people in as many different settings as possible. We used um, a really kind of broad research approach. Um, what we did was create a kind of a suitcase of research activities and we knew what themes that we wanted to research um, and what we wanted to find out about but the way that we did that varied a lot depending on the group of people we were working with. Um, so we wanted to find out about people's communication needs and preferences, people's experiences of consultations, social networks, uh, barriers, choices, use of technology, really, really broad. We weren't just looking at how people um, were kind of involved in consultations. Okay, so uh, some key insights from our research uh, were that, not surprisingly, consultations are a really confusing term. Uh, which was something that we, we had assumed, but we found that even when we, there was one group we went to and uh, they literally had just taken part in a consultation before us, so we sat in for that and you know, somebody came in and did this consultation with them and then we spoke to them about their experience of consultations and nobody uh, knew what a consultation was or was able to kind of understand it because it's a really confusing term. We also learned that questions are really misleading, or can be very misleading. It was something that uh, there was already evidence of, but we found this a lot in our own research as well, and, and were told a lot of examples of this and given examples um, by people who know individuals incredibly well, but know that, you know, have, have witnessed that when they've been put in on the spot and asked to answer questions, the answer that they give is not necessarily representative of that person's views most of the time. But because of the situation and the way in which they've been asked the question, um, you know, they feel obliged to give a response um, and it can be really difficult to do that, especially if those questions are about things that have happened rather than 
things in the here and the now and the place that you are. Um, <clears throat> people with learning disabilities expressed a desire to tell their own stories. So although asking questions was problematic, actually when we let people tell their story and explain you know, the story of their life or really more general stories, we ended up learning a whole a lot more than we ever did if we asked questions. And people felt a lot more comfortable. Sometimes it was because they had stories that you know, they had told uh, many times. Or sometimes it's just because they weren't feeling on the spot. It was very much in their terms. Um, and we were then able to learn a huge amount from that. Um, we found that um, people engaged much more meaningfully with real objects and environments rather than anything hypothetical. So for example, uh, we would do sort of show and tell activities. Um, we tried asking people about what technology they used and how they used it. Uh, we didn't have a lot of success with that, but once we started asking people to, you know, show us what you do with your phone, you know, what, what do you use your phone for? What do you use your iPad for? People were showing us how they used iPads to meditate or, you know, exactly what, how they used their phone and what they used it for. We learned a huge amount. Five was one of the most um, kind of uh, sort of breaking moments for me personally in that it's something that when I thought about it, I already knew, but it, it took um, a sort of real life example for me to understand. And that's the aspirational thinking is limited by the experiences that we have and have been exposed to. And that is the same for absolutely all of us. We can only aspire or imagine things that we are aware of. But for those of us who have control over what we access and where we go and the information that we consume, those experiences are really quite broad. And if we want to explore more things, we can choose to do that. If you have a learning disability and you aren't able to consume information freely because it's not in, an, in a format that's accessible to, to you, or you don't have control over the information that you are um, consuming because maybe somebody else chooses what you get to watch or you know chooses the information you're told those um, experiences are much more limited and therefore your aspirations and imagination is going to be more limited by those experiences which is particularly challenging when it comes to co-creation. Yeah, and in government consultations, a lot of the time, a lot of the local authorities we were working with had the best of intentions, but they were asking people to tell them what their dream day service was, yeah. or what would be your dream, dream service. And actually, if people only know certain things, they're just repeating the things they already do at the day service, so you get caught in a cycle of validating what you're doing is, yeah. is the best possible thing that you can be doing and the thing that everybody really, really wants to be doing because that's what people are telling you. But they can't tell you anything different if they haven't experienced that. So really helpful. Um, and then we found that tangible outputs gave people um, some, a sense of recognition and also accountability. We met a lot of people who always wanted something physical to take away from any meeting or um, sort of any event that had happened so that they had proof of it. Um, so we always took photographs of whatever we, like, whatever people produced and they kept it themselves. We also found, um, which we thought in advance, but you know, we confirmed that technology has got the power to give people with learning disabilities a voice. Not only sort of in a basic people being able to literally express their needs and wants, but also in terms of personality. So we met um, a young man who used um, this eye gaze uh, communication uh, tool to, to communicate. And he had a lot of preset um, phrases in there that were th from things like Only Fools and Horses and um, others of his favourite programmes. So he was able to respond in um, using his sense of humour and actually kind of have banter. And it was great. But not so great was that we found that most people with learning disabilities do not have access to appropriate communication tools and support. So not even like really nice, you know, um, all singing or dancing communication tools, but even very basic communication tools. This was somebody's um, PEX book, which is the Pictorial Exchange Communication System, whereby um, the user will exchange um, a, a, an image of a thing for that actual thing. So an image of crisps for a bag of crisps, for example. And this young lady's PEX book contained biscuit, crisps and foot spa. Those were her world choices. Because she did not have verbal communication, she had no other communication aid, that was her world choices. And 
I mean, that was, you know, that was somebody who had a communication aid. We met lots of people who did not have verbal communication and did not have any communication aids. So, you know, although, yes, it has the possibility to do that, the reality is most people are not getting access to that. And we also learned that supporters um, have a role to play in meaningfully involving people with learning disabilities. That's in a, a number of ways, which we'll go into, um, but it was, it was found that, you know, obviously they were a really important part of this process. So that kind of um, gave us a lot of insight into what might make it difficult to create a, di a kind of meaningful dialogue between local authorities, service providers and people with learning disabilities. And our conclusion was we really need to flip this on its head. We can't create any kind of system in which um, local authorities are asking the questions or setting the topics and kind of making decisions about formats and then asking people to kind of shoehorned their views into it, but we, we felt passionately that this had to be about enabling people with learning disabilities to share their lived experiences with people in power. And we started exploring how we would be able to do that. Um, so we always do co-creation in every project we do. A lot of that time it defaults to Sharpies and Post-its and just getting people to brainstorm. Um, but that was not going to be appropriate in this project. So we had to come up with some really creative ways to co-create with people with learning disabilities. Um, so we, we tried lots of different things. Um, there, was, there were a few things that didn't work, yep. which are not in this presentation because we don't have time. But these are the things that did work. Um, so what we quickly found was when we were trying to explore ways for people to say tell the local authority what was good and bad about a service that they were using people only wanted to tell us the good stuff um, and when we were exploring like different solutions for that um, one of the things we realized was that we were asking people what makes them angry or what makes them frustrated or what's bad and sometimes the people around them were softening it and saying, you oh, know what makes you a little bit cross and things like that so um, we realized it's, it's a lot of it's about language and it, you know no one wanted people to to get upset and things like that. So we, we bought this big um, emoji poo cushion and uh, we had another cushion with the heart eyes and we realised that if we took them in and asked the same question <laughs> it went a lot better because it's really hard um, to get upset when there's a big emoji poo cushion. Um, so we started asking people to hold the cushions and tell us about good and bad things and they were only allowed to have the cushion if they told us something bad um, and that really kind of softened the whole um, experience of talking about bad things that have happened or you've experienced um, and was a lot of fun as well. Um, oh, that's the other thing, it has to be fun. Yeah, it has to be if it's fun. not fun, people just leave the room, yep. which is great. Um, so the other thing that worked really well was creating soap operas. Um, so we also discovered it's quite difficult for people to share difficult and potentially traumatic things that yep. have happened to them. Um, but what we found worked really well was getting people to create soap operas about people like them in their local area um, and different experiences these characters were having. Um, so we put some constraints on it around like, oh, this so in this soap opera there has to be a storyline about education there has to be a storyline about public transport and um, so kind of topics that would, would fit into a government consultation and it worked beautifully and um, we had people creating characters and projecting onto them um, and it, it opened up a lot of experiences yeah. like this was an example of a couple who were on a bus and then and um, you know they they were kind of I think they said bullied on the bus but essentially there was some hate crime going on on the bus and they reported it and it all got sorted and they ended up getting married and stuff um, and this was another character in school who was drinking a lot and um, you know there was a teacher trying to help him and he wasn't accepting help and this was actually quite clearly yeah. based on himself and a relationship he had with his uh, carer who was there and they hadn't been speaking and we weren't even sure if they were both going to come to the event and um, so it really facilitated a kind of nice dialogue between them but also really helped you know start a conversation about different things people were experiencing in different services and um, so that, that was another hit. Um, and through doing this, we started to get ideas for what an event show um, system could look like. So we started sketching out and developing ideas. Um, we were exploring lots of different ideas at this stage. And then quite quickly, to continue with our co-creation, we were taking them back to 
um, potential users and getting feedback and trying to explain what they'd see if the ideas were easy to understand um, and see what people gravitated towards and getting people to kind of build on them as well. So one of our ideas was for a digital diary and that was really popular and people started sketching out what it would look like and what it would do and how they would create diary entries and you know maybe share or not share them with other people um, and that kind of we started leading us down that path um, and then we finally took the decision to focus on this because it wasn't just coming up from users um, but it was clearly viable um, in, in a system level because everyone we met, almost everyone we met, had a paper diary and um, so there was already an existing practice and culture of adults with diaries that they travel around with that they don't write in, um, other people write in them about them, they can't access the information that's inside. In some cases, the, the information is not accurate. Um, but you know, we th thought, well, what if we could take that culture and that practice and make it so that they're the, the creators and the owners of that content, and it's them deciding who accesses it. Um, but it pr it's primarily them that has access to it. So that got us quite excited. Um, and we were work working with developers as well, and they were inputting, so we knew whatever we were thinking was going to be technically feasible. So um, we then did some uh, prototyping around whether, the, whether um, you know, having a digital diary, like a multimedia digital diary, could be feasible. So one of the things we did was we created these little camera kits where we just got two disposable cameras, and um, they came with like you know wedding covers on, which we replaced with like um, a red cover and a green cover and a sort of happy face and a sad face and set of instructions and we put it all together as a kit and gave it to people with um, like a stamped address envelope and said what we want you to do is for the next two weeks take this kit with you everywhere you go and take photographs of anything that um, like is not good, it, that upsets you or annoys you on the red camera and anything that's really good take it on the green camera and then after two weeks post them back to us. And um, we gave it to um, a few people, but one young man was, uh, had no verbal communication and we had met him several times and what we learnt when we got that kit back um, was that actually we learnt a huge amount about his life through those photographs and they were just photographs, there was no text with them at all, um, but we were able to, to learn more than we had in the course of, sort of um, two or three interviews with him and his support staff. So we then um, moved on and used existing technology to trial the um, concept and we used WhatsApp and we set up a group so that um, somebody could uh, f like send us every day photographs or um, text or you know however they wanted they could send us information about what they were doing whenever they wanted to about whatever they wanted to again to see if the um, behavior would be sustained whether it was appealing to carry on doing this and also what people were going to communicate we learned again a huge amount and what we were being sent was really really interesting so it was things like going and playing football the contents of a shopping basket all actually really helpful stuff um, and interestingly even after we finished the prototype we were still receiving messages despite sort of saying this has ended now you don't need to send us any more pictures thanks very much but people were enjoying it and sending us more and this actually caused us to design text back in because yeah, initially we were thinking it would be a multimedia diary in which you could upload audio uh, video or images yeah and we weren't going to put any kind of text fields in it at all but then this user because he can read and write he started off sending us photos but by the end of it he was just he was just writing and then we realized well if you can write actually that's often the most convenient so we ended up designing that back in Yeah, so after the prototyping, we started working with the developers to create um, the first MVP of the product. And um, so we had a clear idea of the functionality um, and we made a paper prototype and everything. And then they started going into sprints. Meanwhile, we were doing user testing in between. And um, we don't have time to talk about all the ins and outs of that, but it was all very interesting and again, caused us to make a lot of changes just in the usability of it. And like we flipped the order of it back and forth. Um, but we're now going to show you a video of what we ended up with after the three, three sprints and a bit of user testing. Daybook is a digital diary for people with learning disabilities. It has been developed with the help of lots of people with learning disabilities. Daybook can help you keep a record of the things you do every day. You can save happy memories and important moments, whether they are good or bad. 
Daybook is a web app, which means that you can use it on a smartphone, computer or tablet. As long as you have an internet connection, you can use it anytime, anywhere. When you want to add a new entry to Daybook, you can choose what you want to talk about, how you feel about it, and then add more information about taking a short video, a photo or writing something. You can use Daybook instead of a paper diary to show different people in your life what you have been doing. You can use it to share your achievements or worries with people if you want to. By using Daybook with someone who supports you, they can get to know you better. For example, they can find out what's important to you and what makes you happy or upset. You can look back through your diary to show people what you have done in the past. You can search Daybook by topic or feeling to find things that have happened in the past. This might be helpful if you have reviews or if you are asked about your experience of something. You can choose what kind of memories you want to see, like good memories about work or food. If you want, you can share your diary entries with service providers. This will help them to understand your life and what you like and don't like. This can help them to make better decisions about how they can best support you and others like you. Daybook keeps all your memories in one place. To find more about how you can get started with Daybook, visit www.daybook.org.uk. Okay, so yeah, so uh, during that time um, we were testing in the three different local authority sites and London as well with a charity um, and then we uh, moved on to piloting in the, three, in the four areas um, and then shortly after that we won um, an award at the UX UK Awards um, for the best not-for-profit category um, and that was awarded for the research and design process that we went through so that was really exciting, a really nice um, reward after um, going through the whole process. Um, but what we want to share now is just some key takeaways so that you can think about how you can apply some of the things we did in this project and our other projects for people with learning disabilities to your own work. So if you do any research or co-creation sessions with people with learning disabilities, um, these are things to think about before, during and after. So first of all, before, if you are into learning disability ex expert, get one on your team ASAP. <laughs> I can't stress this enough. Um, when I started doing this project, it was the first time I'd worked with people with learning disabilities. Um, and I was very aware of my limitations and my knowledge. And um, so I asked for a learning disability expert to kind of be buddied up with me. And that's how Ali and I met. Um, she was brought in as the learning disability expert. This is a picture of Ali's master thesis <laughs> at the University <laughs> of Cambridge. Um, and and yeah, it was just incredibly useful, to all, the, all the prior knowledge that Ali brought about different communication systems, like all the symbol sets, um, Ali's science and Makaton as well, so it was just an en enormous asset. Um, and second of all, make sure you recruit a wide range of participants. And um, so make sure you include people with nonverbal communication and profound and multiple learning disabilities, as these are the people that never get included yeah. in anything. Um, and actually, that's, that's the people who need to be involved the most, because if you can make it work for them, again, principles of inclusive design, if you make it work for the most excluded, it's probably going to be better for everyone. And we didn't manage it in, in this project, but we have in other projects, and we always try, is also to try and include people who have behaviour that can be seen as challenging. Um, because again they are um, often not included in things like consultations they are um, you know sort of really we, we've had difficulty you know actually being able to reach um, people but it's you know we really try and it's sort of that's one of our philosophies is trying to make sure that we are reaching as many sort of people as possible and not just the people it's easiest to reach. Um, third of all, we've mentioned this before, but always go to people, don't make them come to you. I mean, that's just for so many reasons, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's great to go where people already are in a place they feel safe and comfortable and familiar and um, do the YMCA on stage. You might that's end up we doing, there, doing the YMCA on a stage. Um, the, another thing we always do, which is really cringy, but definitely worth doing, is we do a little video introducing ourselves. So it involves us smiling and waving to camera, saying who we are, what our project's about, that we're going to be coming to meet people and roughly what we want to find out from them and that we're looking forward to it. And um, We invite them to get in touch with us with any communication needs and preferences they have so that we can think about those when planning whatever activity we're going to do with them and, um, and just any questions. And then when you arrive, 
bonus, everyone thinks you're famous. Yep. <laughs> so, um, because they've seen you on YouTube. Yeah. You just put it on YouTube unlisted and then send out the, uh, the link to, to wherever you're visiting and people can then watch it as many times as they want. Um, so yeah, great, like a YouTube star. <laughs> and yeah, ch checking people's communication needs and preferences is so important. Just don't make any assumptions. Check what devices people are going to be using, what communication systems people are going to be using, and then design your activity around that. Um, there's quite a lot crammed into this one. This is basically about designing activities that will make it easy for people to participate and allow you to gain meaningful results. So there's quite a lot to that. So we've mentioned not asking direct questions. It is really difficult, but you get used to it. It's more about prompts to start conversations. Um, key is giving people opportunities to tell you stories about their lives. So you might just have some key prompts like say home or work or getting around and then just let them kind of share whatever they want to share related to that. Um, avoiding hypothetical or abstract activities or questions is really important as, as well. So kind of avoiding potential, imagine if you were in this situation, what would you do, how would you feel, uh, is going to be really problematic. And linked to that is focusing on the here and now. Um, so instead of saying like, oh, how do you feel when you go to see the GP, you should be interviewing them at the GP surgery or shadowing them whether they're at the GP and doing an immediate activity just before and after they interact with the GP. So it's always about asking about where you are in the context. Um, and being really careful with aspirational activities or questions. So if you are going to try to do an activity that's all about, you know, imagining the, be the best thing they can ever interact with or do, um, you might want to think about how you can stretch people's aspirations and show them examples of what might be possible mm -hmm. or take them to new places um, or t get them to try out new activities and then tell you how it was or just observe how they feel when they're doing it rather than getting them to imagine. Um, and lastly, projection onto fictional characters can work really well for exploring more difficult topics. Um, so designing sessions that are fun and creative, obviously really important, um, you know, it's always important to make it, uh, you know, useful and enjoyable for the person involved, um, but, you know, you, you sort of know that you've uh, done a good job when, when people are staying in the room and staying engaged. Um, don't try and pack too much into sessions, um, but do... Um, kind of go with more than one thing up your sleeve. So we literally used to roll, we will take a massive suitcase with us. So we'll go in thinking we're gonna do one activity based on what we know about the people we're meeting, but very often we will end up doing something different because you start with one activity, if it doesn't work, just stop, you know, move on. And um, so we always had other things that we could swap to and sort of a plan B, C, D, you know, so that we could just keep moving through. Um, using stories helps to explain what you're trying to do. Obviously, we at one point were doing consultations about consultations, which is like the most confusing thing you can possibly try to explain. And unsurprisingly, when we first did that, people didn't understand what we were there to do. So we wrote um, stories based on real life, um, people's li real life experiences about one person who'd been involved in um, being asked about services and then when services were changed, they were really happy with them because they'd been involved in that process. And somebody who had not had any involvement um, or information about the change in a service and it just happening and the impact that I had on their life and we were able to say we want to help more people have this experience and fewer people to have this really bad experience. Um, making sure that people know they don't have to join in if they don't want, especially when we were going to sort of formal services, people would all be in one room um, because they were going to be taking part in an activity. So we always make sure that we say that you do not have to do this if you don't want to, you are free to leave at any time, there's no obligation. Um, so making that really explicit and making sure that people have got the support that they need um, and are able to fully participate. So if that means you need interpreters, um, you know, who are able to do Makaton or any other, um, you know, on body sign language, whatever it might be, making sure that that's arranged in advance. And don't assume that it will be available at the yeah. service. So just because you're going to service in which there might be a handful of people who can only communicate using Makaton doesn't mean, sadly, that any of the staff know Makaton. So this actually happened to us. We went to a group and there was someone just signing away to nobody that she was feeling sad. And the only person in the room that knew that's what she was trying to say was Ali. 
So you can't make any assumptions about what skills the staff are going to have or what communication materials are going to be available there. So just make sure you arrange everything from your side. Um, make the whole experience as tangible as possible so whatever you're doing you know there are times when we have asked questions but we've done things like made a glitter ball that's a dice so that people can throw the glitter ball and then a question appears on it um, and if they don't like it they can just turn it around so if someone's not on the spot and forced to answer a question they don't want to they can still actually just explore it and choose what they want to talk about if they want to um, so uh, taking the physical props things like the emojis and using a show and tell approach is really really helpful. Um, we always try to think about meaningful incentives and thank yous in all the projects that we do um, and in this project um, I think just being and being meaningfully involved and being genuinely involved and going back time because we went we worked with people over quite a long period of time and we kept going back was really rewarding for the people that took part and um, but some tangible things we did as well was we took um, portrait photographs of people because we quickly found out that people really liked it and then we were printing them out and giving them back to them the next Next time we met them and those were very popular um, and for people who were involved through the research co-creation and prototyping uh, we created certificates as well um, and gave them to people as co-creators of the product and um, which was also um, really well received and one one guy that we met told us basically his whole life story and we took loads of notes and then at the end he told us that he wanted to write a book about his life so instead of just typing up the notes as we normally would we, we wrote the whole story we made it chronological and we wrote it all in first person and we sent it to him um, and someone who supports him and said well maybe this can be a first draft of your book and um, so just trying to think about really personal ways to thank people um, and we found that even just turning up at services with new magazines new pens like unopened glitter and things like that and um, people got really excited because they're so used to <laughs> the same old things being trotted out that are really worn yeah. and just turning up with like nice shiny fresh materials um, which has made people feel really valued and Poundland and Tiger are your yes, friends thanks. here and um, you don't need to spend a lot to get a really good kit. Um, and after, um, it's really important to um, analyse and interpret um, with assistance. So we found there were a number of occasions where if we had just taken the output of a session at face value, we would have got completely the wrong message. So. Uh, this, for example, um, we did an activity around like, what do you do in the week and we were asking people to sort of say whether it was good or bad and this gentleman said that he um, you know, goes to um, work in a charity shop for like four, four days a week and then one day a week he goes to a day centre and he doesn't, um, it, he's sad when he's at the day centre essentially, put a sad face, put happy faces next to every other day when he's at the charity shop and um, so we thought that's what he did in the week and then um, a member of staff told us that actually he's at the day centre four days a week um, and only at the charity shop one day a week so actually it, you know it what we learned from that was you know a lot but it wasn't what was on the paper in front of us it was the the sort of triangulation of information that made that incredibly helpful um, and always letting know, people know what's going to happen next, uh, whether that's in person feeding back or using videos or you know, accessible written feedback. People really value knowing what's happened next and you're not just vanishing. That's it. That was a whirlwind through our project and some key takeaways that we hope you can reapply. And um, hopefully we've still got a bit of time for questions. Hands up if you've got any questions. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. I can't believe, I still can't believe how many creative ideas you just unleashed on us. It was amazing. <laughs> um, so to give you a bit of a context, a context to my question, um, I have family or had family members who went through a combination of strokes, um, mm. uh, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and by extension of that, I've been introduced to many people um, going through similar circumstances. Um, and one thing I've seen that um, there's incredible amount of parallels between what you've talked about and what they go through mm. uh, from difficulties in um, expressing themselves or speech um, impairment or um, even um, um, having trouble memorizing patterns, whether they are mental patterns or physical patterns. My question is more of a, a big question for you. 
Have you considered translating, or have you started maybe thinking about translating everything that you're doing to this group of people? Because I think almost most of it can be, can be put there. I mean, we, we did think that, that that might be the case, and we have worked with people um, living with dementia. Um, we've done quite a lot of work. Um, we found that it wasn't as transferable as we expected. Obviously, some of the skill, like some of the approaches, are, and certainly in terms of, uh, like, some of the ways that we go about doing, you know, research and um, co-creation. But it certainly uh, wasn't a direct. No, it was. It was influenced by, but yeah. not directly transferable. But some of the same principles and some things we tweaked. Like we, we still like so the videos that we used to send before. We we kind of flipped that and we started filming them at yes. the end of sessions with people so they could watch them before we came the next time because every time they met us it was like the first time they met us so um, that worked really well but we just did it in a slightly different way so we would yep. sum up what we had discussed that day in a video in their living room or wherever we were and then they, their, whoever supported them would show it to them just before we came next time so it was fresh in their mind um, I'm trying to think what else we, we, we use cards and card sorting a yeah. bit and things like that but I guess it's some of the principles are the same but it's not directly transferable that we found so far Thank you. I'm going to steal some of the ideas and try to apply Oh do! <laughs> yeah. Oh Thank yeah, free, absolutely free usable Please. by all <laughs> Any other questions? So I've got a question. So, um, um, what's been done with the playbook, and has it been used in any consultations? And what have the results of those been? Yeah. So after the pilot, um, basically they've been trying to get some more funding to do some more developments. So there hasn't been any further development since the MVP. So it's still a little bit buggy. No, there was a little bit of development to build in a supporter function, um, but essentially it needs a little bit more work. So they're still in the process of trying to get more funding and you know kind of get it off the ground. Um, but hopefully that's going to happen soon. Hello. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm doing some work with the, the local offer. Um, just to explain quickly what the local offer is, it's um, local authorities have a responsibility to make sure that uh, information that's needed by uh, kids with special educational needs and disabilities and their parents is available to, uh, to them um, mm -hmm. where they are. Um, and what that tends to look like is uh, a website with a director of services and some information and advice on there. Um, but this group of people, and okay, they're the, they're the kids, but, but I'm also concerned about um, parents of special needs kids who themselves have special needs. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, do I, how do I take your idea of, I mean, because you were making a very specific product for that group. How do we include your ideas into can I say a mainstream website? So we've, we've partially already done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've we've worked on local offers. We've worked with local authorities, and we've done extensive work on how that can be done. How you can build that in, not necessarily into a website, but into a system. So into the process of that, and into the process of planning. Um, so we have done that, and. Um, there are toolkits, aren't there? Yeah, we published a toolkit Available. with Shropshire Council. That yeah. was all looking at um, engagement of children and young people with special educational needs and disabilities. So we can, if you come chat to us in the end, we can tell you how to find it. But also, I think you can still do these activities. And you know, even though it's a website, people can create things that don't look like a website. So I think somebody built a physical diary and had all sorts of ideas about what this diary would do. And it was really helpful for us, even though we were designing an app. Like we knew exactly what value she was looking for from it, even if it doesn't necessarily look like the end product. So if it's more about principles and what people want to gain from it, then you can translate that into user needs and our kind of language. Okay. Thank you. Um, so you showed a lot of um, screen related things with this playbook. Um, have you thought about integrating uh, like tangible objects, like maybe putting some tech into your poo emoji that could pick something up in some sense? So some more tangible tech 
technology that could interact in this way? Yes, we did. Um, <laughs> at some point we were thinking like, will it be a physical object that you'll own and like share your experiences the empathy with? Koala. Yes, there was an empathy koala concept <laughs> in one of our brainstorms. I don't know why Ali decided it was going to be a koala, koala that would like why. sit in your house and you would carry around with you and yeah. stuff. <laughs> yes, in short, yes, we did ex we did think about a lot of different things and for at one point we were thinking that the interface would be completely different depending on who you were and what your needs were. So for some people it might be a physical object, other people it would be a, you know, like a screen interface and that it would all go into one kind of back end and it would still be browsable because there is a back end that's browsable by the yeah. local authority. Um, so yes, we did think about that for a while but then the, the developer kind of... <laughs> Quickly, quickly managed our expectations on what was feasible within the time frame and the budget of the project. But and yeah, the we out. did ex we did explore it for a while. But we yeah. certainly, you know, the the idea of we're aware that not everybody would be able to use the screen independently. But the idea being that people would still be able to have even people with the most complex needs would still be able to have a lot more involvement than they are with a like a paper diary in that even if it's a case of needing to be supported to record what has happened in a day um, would still in all likelihood be able to sort of you know whether that's just touching the screen to set off a video to share at home what's happened in the day so that they you know there's more control over that information and having a little bit of you know input into it um, we're not you know it's not perfect yeah. and obviously we you know there could be you know many variations but um, we hope it's a step in the right direction um. I have a similar question. So, uh, yeah. uh, so different people with different uh, needs, uh, learning disabilities. So there, there must be cases where some groups may need a different kind of a uh, solution. But in order to like satisfy their needs, uh, other things would would be affected. So, did you have to set a benchmark, or did you have to set a limit that okay, this is what will help? Uh, to to give to satisfy the needs of everyone, and maybe it will not really satisfy some group of people. So there were some complaints, maybe or something. Like that. Yeah, I mean, it might not satisfy everyone, obviously, um, but uh, we certainly looked at it in a in a wide range of contexts. So, for example, we we there was uh, there were issues around the diaries with some people who um, had behavior that could be seen as challenging in terms of people not wanting this diary to exist because there was a history of obviously they aren't able to access what's what's in that diary they don't know what's said and there was a history of them taking it home obviously handing it over or it being handed over by an escort from a, a minibus and then there being repercussions because of what's put in this diary and them not being happy about it well for those people if they're able to access all the information on there they know what's been recorded and they are able to to see that themselves you remove that um, problem um, so like we said there will be some people who will need support to be able to use it or even a case of you know not being able to really use it very much at all themselves um, and other people will have to do with the majority of the recording but it is still their voice it, it's and still yeah, a and recording it, of them. Yeah, but there was the other extreme as well, which I don't know if that was kind of where you were going oh, with your possibly. question. That, you know, we, we kind of got in knots, like, are we designing for the extreme on one side, which is like people with non-verbal communication, who might not even have the dexterity to tap and things like that. And then the other end, you've got people who are able to read and write, are, you know, kind of going about their day-to-day -day lives quite independently. And would they be alienated by something that was to look too childish mm. or kind of crude for their needs? So it, it was a really difficult balance. And we really didn't want to design something that was just for the people who are more independent Painting and have more more kind of range of communication and so I think we steered more towards Ali's point of worrying about the other extreme more just because yeah. they are the extreme that are more more often excluded um, but we did find that for more able people like uh, Shaleen who was in the video who is very active on like social media and blogs and is kind of like the the kind of early adopter high-end persona because yeah. he's very tech savvy and um, you know very 
you know, communicative anyway, but he loved it and he was in the video and everything. So we do feel that we struck a good balance in um, the end. That was one of the reasons why we used emojis as well, rather than like yes. a traditional um, symbol set. So any of the existing symbol sets that are used by people with learning disabilities, because obviously emojis are a mainstream, widely used, they are not a sort of specialist um, communication tool set. So um, that was one of the reasons why we used that, was to sort of make yeah. it... It's more widely. mainstream, it's like, well, I, I use emoji, we use emojis to communicate, yeah. so in that respect, it doesn't look, if someone, at a glance, it doesn't look like something, it's yeah. like a specialist um, piece of equipment.